Back on the record, this is the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and a couple of the prosecutors are present. We are outside the presence of the uh, jury at this time. Um, <clears throat> I thought during the break, I thought a little more about the uh, the uh, objection, Ms. Pengler, that you made, made with respect to the uh, school work in um, exhibit P-TR-347A. I think if there had been some testimony that the defendant was just copying his school work from some source or that his school work was sophisticated but not intelligible, uh, I, might, um, I might agree with your concern or I might have uh, concern, but uh, the testimony in general, and there has been a lot of it from professors and from research assistants and from other students, has been that in general the defendant's written product was good and that um, that um, he, he was, um, uh, um, in general, an excellent student, uh, at least in terms of his written um, work. So uh, I don't have the concern that, well, um, you know, this could just be sophisticated or sound sophisticated, but it, it could be something that's not coherent or intelligible. Uh, and the jury, yet the jury would be considering it um, for the issues raised by the insanity defense and for um, the culpable mental state elements of the crimes charged, I think when considered in conjunction with the other testimony, that's, um, I'm comfortable that the jury will, um, um, will understand why this has been admitted and I'm comfortable that whatever inferences, reasonable inferences can be made, the jury will choose which ones they think they should make, but I'm not concerned that they're going to be misled or confused into thinking that this sounds uh, sophisticated and it sounds uh, scientifically complex, but that really it's not something that's intelligible or something that is coherent or something that's logical. There, there's no basis for me to believe that. So, Okay, is there anything I, we need to talk about before I bring the jury in on behalf of the people? No? Your Honor, only with regard to logistical planning for the rest of the day, we're still targeting, uh, trying to be done by the end of today, and I wonder if the court would entertain even a partially abbreviated lunch from one and a half hours to one hour and 15 minutes or, or whatever the court thinks is appropriate just so that we can finish up today. And when you say finish up today, that includes 3.30? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. We can do that. Anything from the defense, Mr. King? No. All right, let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated. The record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Ms. Allen, I remind you that you're still under oath. And Ms. Brady, you may proceed with your cross-examination of Ms. Allen. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Um, I don't have too many questions for you, um, but, but I do have some. Uh, in, in general, uh, James seemed to keep to himself. Is that fair to say? Yes. And you felt that he was somewhat socially awkward? That's my opinion. I mean, from, yes. Okay. And he was introverted? Yeah. A little bit quirky? Yeah. 
Um, but he was always nice. Yes. Okay. And that first text that he sent to you on April 9th, uh, you had never texted him before, correct? Correct. He texted you first, and that was what, what the jury has seen on April 9th of 2012. Yes. And that was completely unexpected on your, on your part. You were very surprised to see that he had texted you. Yes. Usually you would have to be the one to talk to James, not vice versa. Correct. And uh, he would be in class with you every day for the school year, basically, and he, he would not speak to you in class. You would always have to approach him and speak to him. Initiate a conversation, yes. Okay. And you thought that it was weird that when you were in class, he wouldn't really talk, but then after class, you would get texts from him. Yes. And that one text came about your shorts, and you took that as sort of a flirty text from him. Yes. And you came to believe that maybe he had a bit of a crush on you? Mm, perhaps, yes. When you guys went hiking, uh, I think you testified earlier, it was his idea maybe to go hiking? Correct. And you thought it would be fun, so you agreed to go? Yes. And you said uh, you were more talkative than he was on the hike? Yes. And he was more talkative once you actually started hiking versus earlier in the car? Yeah. So after a little bit of time, he came out of his shell a little bit, at least, on the hike. Yeah. You uh, and James never really spoke on the phone. It was either in person or by text? Yes. And the, the most common way you guys communicated was by text? Yes. Even if you would be passing him in the hall, he wouldn't speak unless you spoke first. From what I remember, yes. And when you were speaking to him, he wouldn't make very good eye contact. Is that fair? And unless you know, provoked, you know, I said hello, and then he would look at me. Okay, and at times, I think you've said he would fidget around and look down and then eventually look at you in the eye. Yes. Even when you would run into him at the 24-hour fitness, same thing. You would have to approach him to have any interaction with him. Yes. Even after you went hiking? Yes. You spoke to Mr. Brockler about the difference between the coursework and the lab work. Is it fair to say in lab you, you have to interact with other grad students and the PI and the people in the lab? Yes. And even though in class there's some uh, discussions, that's mostly listening to lectures or studying, and it's more independent work. Uh, classroom, yes, it's independent, yeah. And then in the lab it gets a little more interactive. Uh, I mean, it's, no one in my lab would have my same project, but of course I'd have to, you know, interact with your lab mates. Ideally, you would, mm -hmm. you know, like your coworkers, but that's not always the case. Now, you saw James's third lab presentation, you said. Yes. Uh, you felt like he used weird jokes during his presentation? I, I felt that way during like, all, all of them. It was just um, his style, I guess, of presenting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you thought he, his voice sounded a little bit like Kermit the Frog when he was doing presentations? I guess so. I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and it was a little bit awkward? Well, for, for me, I mean, I get it. I wouldn't have the confidence to kind of throw jokes around when I was presenting in a formal scientific setting. So that's it made me nervous, like, just because it's like, oh my gosh, I hope. Yeah. Because you'd be worried that that would be uh, like an inappropriate setting to have jokes. Yeah. And you thought since he could do it, he was confident enough to use those jokes. Yes. Or maybe a nervous tick. I don't know. It just—it was a common theme throughout each presentation. Okay. 
And in that last one in particular, you felt that he uh, did not seem to be prepared and seemed uninterested? Correct. Now that, the lab presentation, that's different than the, uh, the big formal prelim at the end of the year, right? Yes. And that's the one where you were not in the room. You could just see him, but you couldn't hear what was going on. In the yes. Room. Okay. That was the very last time you saw him was at that prelim where you could see him taking the prelim. Correct. And it was the next day where he told you by text uh, that he didn't that he didn't pass and he was going to quit. I yeah, I can look at the dates of the text, but yes, I believe so. Okay. Go ahead and check if that'll help you remember. That was in June. It'll be June 8th. Oh, yes, June 7th. Yeah. And you didn't see him again after that? No. Nope. And you didn't run into anyone who had seen him after that? Like other people at the school didn't seem to have run into him after that either? Uh, no, and that's because we're not in classes anymore, so the six of us would not really congregate together, we're choosing our labs and um, kind of having a break at that point. And you didn't run into them at 24-hour fitness or around anywhere? No. Okay. Now it was at, when you were at the gym on July 8th, when you uh, thought of him and thought you would reach out by text and see where he was and what he was doing? Uh, July 8th, yeah. It just it struck my memory because I, that sometimes where I would see him and I hadn't for a while. And that's when you got that text back about dysphoric mania? Yes. And that he was bad news bears? Yeah. And that it was in your best interest to ab avoid him? Yeah. And floodgates open now? Mm-hmm. Yes. Can I get a page um, 1046-59? It's the very last page of that text, Your Honor. Is that okay? For yes, you absolutely. It? And just go past the yep, please. There you go. Thank you. Up just a little bit. Great. Now, um, it, it, Mr. Brockler asked you about uh, where you, you say, are you okay, I'm not scared of that stuff, referring, referring to the, the reference to dysphoric mania. I mean, you say, I've been there, believe me, not the exact same, but I can understand. And he writes, <coughs> yep. Now, it's not it, completely clear what the yep is in refer, reference to in, in that whole paragraph that you wrote to him, correct? Yeah, correct. He could just be acknowledging the comments that you made? That or answering the question, the are you okay, yeah, in, any of those, like, yeah. So it's, it's not clear what, what he's saying yep to, is it? No, um, from that it's just like, I don't want to talk about it, so. Okay, all right, thank you. And then that was the last text you got from him. Correct. Um, Mr. Mr. Brockler asked you if you saw any change in James uh, from August of that school year of 2011 to um, till, uh, June, the last time you saw him in 2012. Yes. Um, is it fair to say he was a little bit more involved in the first semester than the second semester? I think that's hard for me to say because I didn't know him till second semester. Did it? Did well, it I mean, I didn't have more interaction with him until second semester. So, I mean, yeah, it's hard for me, it's hard for me to say. Did you get the impression he participated more in the first semester than the second semester? I, I mean, I don't remember that the first semester was such a hard um, time. <laughs> there, it, we, we were just so busy. Um, I mean, I, I do remember he wasn't hanging out with his normal friends after that. Like, I didn't, didn't see him with Gargi anymore. Um, 
in the second semester? Yeah. And, and do you remember, uh, and it's been a long time ago, right? Yes. This is 2015, and we're trying to remember back to 2011. Yes. Do, do you remember when you, when you spoke to Detective Craig Apple and Detective Todd Fredrickson on August 29th of 2012? I don't recall the names. However, I talked to, I mean, I talked to several. Do you recognize Detective yes. Apple here? Yes. To my right. Um, do you remember, uh, do you remember Detective Apple asking you whether you saw any change in him in the months or weeks from when you met him to when you guys stopped talking? And do you remember that you told him just the fact that I never saw him hanging out with anyone second semester? Yeah, and that's, yeah, what I just said. Like, I didn't right. see him with Gargi anymore, and that's who I usually saw him with. And, and, and you also said, gentlemen. so, I'm sorry. Oh, some other, I don't remember their names, but there were two other students that he would hang out with as well. And he was not with them in the second semester? That I would see, no. Okay. And do you also remember saying, uh, so he just wouldn't talk or do anything, like he wouldn't participate at all, at least he did a little in the first semester? Uh, I mean, I guess, I, I, I'm sure I said it, obviously, it's right there. Um, and if you said that, would you think, since that was closer in time to the period we're talking about, would that, if you said that, do you think that that was your impression, at least at that time? Yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Holmes was never really someone who tried to stand out in a crowd, is that fair? Well, I mean, in the presentations that he, he gave, definitely he stood out in his style. Um, but, I mean, like, from when I first met him at, you know, the, um, the orientation that we had, like, our interview weekend in February, like, I wouldn't pick him out of, you know, I didn't really remember him, so. Okay. And uh, what didn't seem like someone who was trying to draw attention to himself in class or socially? No. Can I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes, you may. I think that's it, Ms. Allen. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any redirect, Mr. Brockler? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Ma'am, could you uh, put up 54, please? I just want to make sure I, I'm clear on something. You had been asked by Ms. Brady about when you received a text from the defendant saying that he had failed the prelims and there had been some discussion about it happening right after the prelims? Yeah, I was going to say that. It's June 11th. Yeah, yeah can, can we blow that up, ma'am, where it says that? It looks like this uh, confirmation from the defendant takes place at 1118 on June the 11th. Is that what you see too? Yes. And you didn't get notified either in person, text, or any other means before then that he had failed the prelim? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple things to confirm with you. The description that you went through with Ms. Brady about him being quiet and quirky and introverted and a little socially awkward. A couple things. One, was that incredibly inconsistent with other guys in the science field that you had had exposure to? Objection no. asked and answered. Overruled? No. And was that consistent throughout the time that you knew him from roughly August 11th through, I guess, May and then July of 2012. Yes. Yeah. Do you know if um, the defendant and Gargi broke up sometime around the end of March, early April? I did not know. When you described for Ms. Brady in reference to a statement that you made to Detective Apple uh, some time ago that he seemed less involved with those people, is that what you're referring to, him stopping hanging out with Gargi and maybe a tall, kind of really pale guy with light hair. Yeah, like I don't know his name, yeah. That okay. Guy. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about. I mean, yes, and that, it, I just didn't see them, you know, having coffee or something together. May I have a moment, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, not, nothing further, thank you. Is there any recrimes? Very briefly. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're almost done. Okay. Uh, it, it was m in the second semester, it was, it was more, though, than just not hanging out with Gargi. You said that um, he wouldn't participate at all 
at least he did a little in the first semester. Do you remember saying that to Detective Apple? I don't recall, but I mean, it, like if it's there, sure. That I mean, that also might just be from the content of the material. Like I'm sure I was less participatory in the la in the last two classes, just because they didn't interest me as much. Um, but and I'm, you don't know why, but he did seem to participate a little bit less in the second semester. Yes. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. There appears to be a question from the jury, Miss Allen. So I'm going to ask you to uh, please give us a moment, okay? And you can wait right there. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Give me just a moment, please. All right, will counsel please approach? The jury has submitted a two-part question that I have found on the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law is appropriate. The question is, did you see James with his dyed red hair? And if so, what was your impression of his changed look? I did not see him with that until um, after the event. Um, and, I mean, it was surprising. Okay. Is there a follow-up question uh, from the people? No. From you, Ms. Brady. Just to make sure you saw that either on TV or in the newspaper, the picture of James with the red hair. Correct, and the, in the probably both newspaper and TV. And that's when you thought it was surprising. Yes. Not what he looked like when you knew him. No, I never, yeah, never saw him with red hair before. Thank you. <laughs> May Ms. Allen be released from her subpoena, Mr. Brockler? Yes, sir. Is there any objection? All right, Ms. Allen, thank you. Please call your next witness. David Bunch. Come around this way, please. If I could have you raise your right hand for me so that I can administer an oath, do you solemnly swear or affirm in a penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please be seated. Could you please tell us your full name for the record, and would you please spell your first, middle, and last names? David Lance Bunch, D-A-V-I-D-L-A-N-C-E. B-U-N-C-H. Mr. Edson, you may proceed. How are you employed? I'm employed with 24-hour fitness. What is your job title? A senior regional loss prevention manager. What is 24-hour fitness? 
it's a uh, fitness company. Do you have stores here in the local metro area of Denver? We do. Um, how long have you been employed by 24-Hour Fitness? Approximately 17 months. What are some of your job responsibilities? Uh, my main focus is to protect the assets of the company. Are you a records custodian for 24-Hour Fitness? I am. Are you familiar with new membership orientation agreements uh, for 24-Hour Fitness and new members? Yes. Are you familiar with detail usage records for members of 24-Hour Fitness? Yes. Can new members uh, sign up online? Yes. How does that work? It's one of the two main ways that a, a member or a guest can sign up. Um, they basically can go to the website um, and it gives them that option of signing up online. It's very simple. It says web sign up. If a new member signs up online for membership, are they required to provide information? Yes, they are. Uh, are they required to provide an email address? Yes. Does 24-Hour Fitness routinely provide authentic copies of the membership agreements to its members? Uh, yes, they do, especially if it's web-based. Uh, once that agreement is completed, it, that agreement is emailed to the email provided by that member. Does 24-Hour Fitness also keep a, an official copy of that particular membership agreement? Yes. And do you have access to those types of membership agreements? I do. <clears throat> the membership agreements, um, also referred to as new membership orientation agreements, um, copies that are provided, are they fair and accurate copies? They are. Governor, may I approach the witness, please? You may. Sir, I've handed you two exhibits, 1094A and 1094B. Are you familiar with those documents? Yes. What, first, we'll start with 1094A. What, in general, is that document? This is a standard membership agreement. Is that a membership agreement that can be done online? It is. 1094B, what does that refer to? This is a, a membership usage gap. I'm going to start and ask you some questions about 1094A, the new membership orientation agreement. Is there a particular customer membership number associated with 1094A? There is. What is that number? It is a club membership agreement. It is uh, located, I think, on the third page, although it says page one on the bottom. It is uh, L, as in Lima, D as in Delta, 73516. Is there a particular member name associated with this document? There is. Who is that? James Holmes. Is People's Exhibit 1094A a fair and accurate and complete copy of the new membership orientation agreement for that account LD73516? Yes. Have you had an opportunity to compare that particular exhibit against the records at 24-Hour Fitness for this particular new membership agreement related to LD73516? I have. Explain what you observed. It's the exact same agreement. The agreement that we have, we keep in our records, is the same one that we're emailed, so they're, they're matching. Is that an authentic copy? It is. Is there any changes or manipulations or anything related to that that you observed? Not at all. 
some specific questions. People's Exhibit 1094A, um, is that a computer-generated a computer -generated business record that's created by 24-Hour Fitness? It is. And then copies are sent to the members, is that right? Yes. Are the computer entries made in the regular course of business? Yes. Were those participating in making the records acting in the routine course of business? Yes. The input procedures that are used to create People's Exhibit 1094A, are they accurate? Yes. Were the entries in People's Exhibit 1094A made within a reasonable time after the transaction involved? Yes. Is the information for 1094A transmitted by a reliable person, such as yourself, who has knowledge of that particular document um, and has access to the original documents uh, at 24-Hour Fitness? It is. Does 24-Hour Fitness regularly receive, maintain, and rely upon the information uh, transmitted in the creation of these records? Absolutely. The information, um, and I'll direct your attention, it's the third page, but the, the page that had the agreement number that you were referring to. It says page one at the bottom, but it's actually the third page of 1094A. Do you see where I'm referring to? Yes. That information, um, particularly at the top, who provides that information? The guest, the person signing up. Okay. So that information, uh, the information provided by the guest or the person or the member signing up, um, is that information used as part of a business relationship between that member and 24-Hour Fitness? Yes. Explain how that works, please. It's the, it's the genesis of the business agreement, meaning that we need this information to be able to get paid. So, therefore, we rely on the accuracy of this to be able to uh, complete that business arrangement. Does 24-Hour Fitness substantially rely upon that information contained in the records for a business purpose? Yes. Okay. Anything additional aside from being paid uh, as far as the business purpose that you're relying upon that information? Well, the other part of it is, is uh, well, the most important part, of course, is that business relationship but it's also tied into ensuring that the uh, policies, regulations is all, are also read and agreed to. And is People's Exhibit 1094A in its totality a fair and accurate and complete new membership agreement for the account LD73516? Yes. Have you turned to People's Exhibit 1094B, please? Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. What is that exhibit? It is a uh, member usage outline. What is uh, the usage outline? What are you talking about? It, it's, uh, we have um, a system in all of our clubs which requires a, a member to uh, check in when they arrive at the club. Does this document reflect um, times and dates of check-in? Yes. Is there a particular account number associated with People's Exhibit 1094B? There is. What is that account number? It is L is in Lima, D is in Delta, 73516. Is that the same account number that you read for People's Exhibit 1094A? Yes. Is there a particular member associated with People's Exhibit 1094B? Yes. James Holmes. Have you had an opportunity to view People's Exhibit 1094B and compare it to the internal records that 24-Hour Fitness has related to the usage document? Yes. And what did you find? They matched. Any changes or manipulations between the document? None. Is People's Exhibit 1094B a fair, accurate, and complete copy of the detailed usage record for that particular account, LD73516? Yes. Is People's Exhibit 1094B a computer-generated business record created by 24-Hour Fitness? Yes. Is that the usage detail, is that something that a customer would be provided a copy of at all? No, not not in normal everyday business. It's used it's used for us to be able to to track a member usage. Okay, you keep that and maintain it within twenty four hour fitness regular course of business. Yes. 
are the computer entries for People's Exhibit 1094B made in the regular course of business? Yes. Were those participating in making the records acting in the routine course of business? Yes. Are the input procedures for People's Exhibit 1094B accurate? Yes. Were the entries made within a reasonable time after the transactions involved? Yes, it's instantaneous. What do you mean by instantaneous? Go ahead. What did, what did you say? It's instantaneous. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, what do you mean by it's instantaneous? According to this, this record, it does show that um, each visit was done via a bioscan. And a bioscan is instantly tagged to that member, which then tags the time immediately when it's, when it's uh, met with that member. Does it also record the date as well? It does. People's Exhibit 1094B is the information transmitted by a reliable person such as yourself that has knowledge of the events and the record um, reported. Yes. Does 24-Hour Fitness regularly receive, maintain, and rely upon this information that's contained within People's Exhibit 1094B uh, for their record-keeping purposes? Yes. Is the information provided by the member, as you described in the scan, is that used as part of a business relationship between 24-Hour Fitness and its members? Yes. Does 24-Hour Fitness substantially rely upon the information contained in these records and the detailed usage, and I'm talking about 1094B, do they rely upon that for any business purpose? Yes. In totality, is People's Exhibit 1094B a fair, accurate, and complete copy of the detailed usage for the particular account LD73516? Yes. Judge, pursuant to 401402, 901A, 901B, and 8036, we move for admit both move for admission of 1094A and 1094B. Is there any objection? Just under 401 and 403. Can I see those records, please? All right, would counsel please approach?
go, sir. All right, the uh, rules 401 and 403 objection is overruled, and both exhibits are admitted and may be published. That's uh, P-TR-1094A and P-TR-1094B. If we could please have 1094A3. And just scroll to the top. Sir, do you see the, uh, we have on the screens 1094A. Can you see that on your computer screen in front of you? Yes. Okay. Um, to the top right, I see a club membership agreement. Is that where you're reading the LD three? Uh, 73516 number? Yes. Is that the membership agreement? It is. Um, or otherwise an account number? Yes. Um, I see a club of enrollment and some information below that. Describe for the jury, what are we looking at there? Where it says membership, that's the type of membership that the person is agreeing to or selecting. And when they're, they're selecting a single, that means they're selecting one club. And was there a particular club selected? And if you continue on uh, across from the single to the right, it says 00572. That is the club number that was selected. Are you familiar with that club? I am. Where is that located? It's uh, in, in the Denver Metro on, uh, over in Lowry. Okay. Um, if we could scroll down just a little bit, please. Um, personal information, who does this account belong to? This account under personal information belongs to last name of Holmes, first name of James. Okay. Fair to say address and phone number is there as well? Yes. And then the email address is the dsherlockb at hotmail.com? Yes. Okay. Let me take that down. Thank you. Actually, I'm sorry. Can we have 1094A3 up one more time? If we could scroll down just a bit more to um, beyond the liability section to the membership. So where it says monthly payment membership, does this describe what we're talking, what we're looking at here? Uh, right underneath there, where it says begins on the left, that is the first day of enrollment. That is the first day that they're able to at attend or or go to that club to uh, work out. The monthly dues, that is what is going to be charged on a monthly basis to be able to use that club, and that is twenty four ninety nine. So is it fair to say that this particular membership was uh, created and, and active as of? Roughly November 8th, 2011? Yes. All right. Thank you. We can take that down now. If we could look at 1094B1, please. What are we looking at here? This is the, uh, as it states on the very top, usage by customer number. And that customer number on the very first column is the LD73516. And all of those correspond with uh, James Holmes, is that correct? Yes. Um, that Club 572, is that the Lowry Club? Yes. Um, fair to say that there's the date and the timestamp? Yes. When I see that scan flag and it says B, what's that referring to? Bioscan. Is that what you were talking about earlier? Yes. There's only two types of scan. It's either manual with an M or B, a bioscan. What is the bioscan? What does that mean? For customer convenience. Uh, what we've done is we've, we have a bio scan in each of our clubs, um, which is tied to that membership. So when someone joins a club, they can then uh, decide that they want to do a bio scan again to, to uh, expedite the process when they arrive at the club. So they have to go through a, a quick process where they're at the beginning, when they, they're first, in the first time they're at the club, um, and it will scan their finger. And that finger is tied directly to the membership. So when they, when they show up at the club, they'll go ahead and enter in a, a personal access code, but they also do it the very first when they first do the bioscan. Uh, then they'll scan their finger on this bioscan. Uh, when they enter in their personal code, that pulls up their membership. Then when they scan their finger, it ties into that membership to speed, again, speed it up. Okay. The warning level G, what does that mean? It means green. Uh, there's three warning levels. There's a green, yellow, and red. Green means everything's okay with the account. Okay. If we could have the second page of 1094B, please. Fair to say this is a continuation of the detailed usage for this account? Yes. Um, we have it on the screen here, but after, as of May 10th, 2012, were there additional entries into that Lowry Campus 24-hour fitness by Mr. Holmes? Uh, speaking of the second page, yes, it, it goes through, um, the very last one was that July 6th, 2012. Okay. 
Your Honor, can I have one moment, please? Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Cross-examination, Ms. Six. Questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, sir, I noticed that this customer usage record only goes back to January 10th of 2012. W were, were there no records from before then, or that's just as long as you keep them? This is the record that is available with this membership. Oh, okay. It's, so all records with this membership are, are detailed here. Okay. Um, you indicated the last date that somebody uh, went to the Lowry camp, at, uh, and it would have been Mr. Holmes went to the Lowry gym, was on July 6th. Is that right? Uh, it, from this exhibit, it looks like, yeah, the last time it was Bioscan was on July 6th, yes. And a Bioscan is you stick your finger in a little device and it reads it, right? It, again, it's tied into that, that PIN number which links to membership within links to the, the fingerprint, yes. Right, but when someone goes to the gym, they just kind of stick their finger in, in a thing and it does a Bioscan of your finger or something? Yes, it's a, it, it, I think it does a, a eight points of a fingerprint. Um, okay. And many times, you know, even if it's a little smudgy, it, it won't even take it. You have to clean it and do it again. It's very accurate. But again, um, it's very important that they do that, that their, their own pin code first before doing the, the fingerprint. Right. Like back in November, December, or January, when they first opened the account, they would set that up. And then every time you go to the gym to gain entry, you just stick your finger in a little device. After putting in your entry code, yes. Yes. Um, now, uh, just also quickly, uh, I want to, the last five times that Mr. Holmes went to the gym, uh, the times are what, 11.09 p.m., 10.18 p.m., 11.47 p.m., 10.41 p.m., and 12.44 a.m., being 12.44 in the morning after midnight, is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything else. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. is there any redirect? No, thank you. And the jury does not appear to have any questions for this witness. May this witness be released from his subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. With any objection? Ms. Hayes? Yes, no? Okay. Sir, thank you. You can uh, give those back to Mr. Edson. Do you want to call your next witness, or do you want to take a lunch break? It's, we can call the next witness. Right? All right. Uh, Louis Perea, Your Honor. Okay. Good morning, sir. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please be seated. <coughs> Could you please tell us your full name for the record? Sure, Louis Perea. And can you spell your first and last names? Sure, first name L-O-U-I-E, last spelling P-E-R-E-A. Mr. Orman, you may proceed. How are you employed? I'm employed as the Arapahoe County Undersheriff. What is the Undersheriff? The Undersheriff has overall responsibility for all activities of the Sheriff's Office. You're like the second-in-command executive officer of the Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. What was your job back in uh, 2012? I was the Bureau Chief for the Detention Administrative Services Bureau. Would that include the, the, the jail, the, the courthouse? Uh, the, the, the kind of deputies we see in here? Yes, sir. And as the undersheriff and the person in charge of the jail, uh, were you familiar with and are you familiar with the way that the, the jail conducts business and does things? Yes, I am. And are you also familiar with the way that the jail has overseen the uh, defendant while in custody? Yes, sir. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, something called kites. Are you, are you familiar with what a kite is? Yes, I am. And I'm not talking about the things that your kids might play with in the park, but in the jail, what is a kite? <clears throat> a kite is a, a means for a person incarcerated to communicate with our jail staff. And what is the way that that happens at the Arapahoe County Jail? And let's actually talk about from, let's say, July of 2012, and if it's changed to, to the present, how has it changed? How, is that, how does that work? 
Uh, we have a system, it's called the ASK system, A-S-K. Stands for Administrative Services Kiosk System. And how, how does, how does an, a person in the jail go about then sending a kite using that ASK system? Sure. When they're enrolled uh, into the ASK system, they then have the opportunity to uh, send kites, uh, electronic uh, document, to our jail staff. Is it like sort of like an email to jail staff? Yes, it's an easy way to say it is. And is there a way that the jail has to make sure that it's the particular uh, person in the jail, the particular um, inmate, I, and I'm not sure the correct word even for that, but I'll just say person in your custody, to make sure that it's them sending the kite as opposed to just anybody pretending to be them? Yes, sir. When we first implemented uh, the new system back in April of 2012, from that time to the, about the first, uh, about uh, January of 2013, any person brought into our facility was enrolled and they had to use their fingerprint. We used a biometric fingerprinting. And it's somehow, so uh, from let's say July uh, 20th through the end of July of 2012, that would have been the system you have to use your fingerprint to send a kite? To access the kiosk system, yes. And, and in order to send a kite, you need to access the kiosk system? Yes, sir. And then in 2013, did that change? Yes, it did. How did that change? Uh, rather than using biometric fingerprinting, we changed to a unique number, which is a jacket number, plus a password that the uh, inmate would use as and well. Would that be unique to each person in the jail, each inmate in the jail? The jacket number is yes. And how about the, the passcode? The inmate would create that themselves, yes. And can you just sort of explain what these kiosks look like and describe what uh, someone would go through to use the kiosk to send a kite? Sure. Uh, a kiosk is located in, uh, at least one kiosk is located in each of our housing units. Uh, when an incarcerated person wants to send a kite, they sign on. Uh, once they sign on, uh, they have several options. Uh, kiosk system is used to uh, send a request, uh, send a grievance uh, for an inmate to access their inmate account, uh, inmate handbook. When, um, well, when a kite is sent, is there a computer record sent of it? Yes, there's an electronic record. And I'm going to approach you with what's been marked for identification as People's Exhibit 1088. <coughs> And please take a look at that and tell me if you're familiar with it. Yes, I am. Now, um, have you looked at your system to see if the defendant in this case sent any kites? Yes, sir. And would it be fair to say you're an overall charge of that system as the undersheriff? Yes, I am. And in all the administrative work at the jail? Yes, I am. And take a look at 1088, and is that a record associated with any particular inmate? Yes, it is. Who is that? That's James Holmes. And is that the defendant in this case? Yes, sir. Is the Sheriff's Office a government agency? Yes, it is. And the, let's say the information on the top of each page, uh, does that demonstrate the activities of the government agency? Yes, it does. And are those computer generated? They are. Are they made in the regular course of business? Yes, sir. And the people participating in the creation of these, are they acting in the routine course of business? Yes, sir. Are the input procedures to create these documents accurate? Yes, sir. And are these entries made in a, within a reasonable time after the transaction involved, in other words, after the input is done? Yes, sir. Is the information translated, um, transmitted by reliable people with knowledge of the events contained therein? Yes, sir. And um, does your office regularly receive and maintain and rely upon the information transmitted in these types of uh, kites and reports to um, do your business as the jail? We do. Move to admit 1088, Your Honor. Is there any objection? Your Honor, we have no additional objections. Uh, would counsel approach, please?
All right, the objection is overruled, and the exhibit is admitted. That's P-TR-1088. Your Honor, with the court's permission, what I'd like to do is I have copies for the jury. And I'd like to have them distributed, and then while they have them, I want to put something up on the Elmo, and just so to put some of these things in context so the jury can understand what the records mean. All right, that's fine. Okay. If you would tender those to Ms. Gerlings, please, so that she can distribute them. Members of the jury will give you a copy of this exhibit, and that'll be a copy for each of you. If it's okay with the court, I'm going to ask questions from over there while I have this on the machine. That's fine. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, we have it in our system. I didn't realize that, Your Honor. All right. We can put up the first page. And if we could just take a look at this, um, at the top of it, we have um, a, uh, the case number and then an ID number. Is that the ID number for the defendant in, in the jail? Yes, it is. And then over on the right, it says library request. Is there a library at the jail? There is. And uh, how many volumes do you know? We have approximately 9,000. Whoops. Can inmates check out and read uh, books? They can. How, how many can they get at a time? How often can they do that? Generally, we want to limit it to three books at any given time. And can they request specific books? Yes, they can. Now, do they get to go to like a big room and browse stacks of books, or, or how does that work? Uh, generally, we have what's called a book cart, and it's brought to specific housing units, and inmates have an opportunity to look at what books. If there's a book... Uh, on the book cart that they want that's not, uh, it's not there, they can then request a book through the kiosk system. And then underneath here it says status closed unfounded. What would that mean? I mean, an unfounded request for books. What, what, how does that work? Sure. The status, we have three open, pending, and closed, and founded or unfounded. In essence, uh, this kite or this request was answered, and unfounded is generally just used for grievances. Um, founded, unfounded is there's some merit to their grievance. So, but this wouldn't be a grievance? That is correct. It would so not. it's sort of an automatic thing that goes on there? It is. If we could go to the next page, please. And go just uh, to the uh, actual message. <coughs> when it says here to system administrator, obviously it's, um, not, we, we don't need to to do that. Where it says system administrator, what, is, what does that mean? Is that sort of a general message to the whole jail? Yes, what it is is that particular kite or request is basically put in uh, the kiosk repository. Your Honor, I don't have any further questions um, with the document. I don't have any further questions for the witness. And... Um, the jury has has the exhibit. Okay. Members of the jury, I'll give you a few moments to review the exhibit, okay?
Okay, the records should reflect that the jury just finished uh, reviewing P-TR-1088. Uh, Cross-examination, Ms. Higgs? Yes, and this won't be very long. We'll get out for lunch soon. <laughs> um, with regard to the library request process, it says on the first page of this, at the first request, is there like a library book search function available? Do you know if there's some sort of computerized book search function? There is not, ma'am. Okay. So the only option an inmate really has is to put a request in through that kiosk system if they want, say, a particular book? Oh, they have a few options. Uh, they can put in a request, or uh, they can request for that book to, to be ordered, and it can be sent to them as well if we don't have it in stock. Okay. And there's also a request to have some books sent if, if they're... Um, and they have to be approved books. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You can't just order any book that you want under the sun. No, it needs to be approved. Okay. Um, now, if somebody requests a particular book, it may not actually be in your 9,000 volume library. Is that fair? Th that is correct. And then, is it correct that what the librarian, the librarian's the person that will physically bring the book cart to the different housing units so that um, people in your custody can take a book and check it out from that librarian, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If the particular book is not available, the librarian then may select something else in that same genre or something else she thinks is close to it to offer to the person requesting a book. Is that fair? They may offer, yes. Okay. And if they're um, requesting a general category of books, it's also kind of up to the librarian to, you know, maybe pull a few options and see if one of those will work for for, for the person in your custody. That's possible. Okay. And nothing on here actually indicates what book was checked out. Nothing in these records, correct? Nothing in this record. Okay. So these are just requests. It doesn't even indicate whether if certain specific books were requested, like uh, Don Quixote, whether that is something that was even in the library. It doesn't tell us that on here, does it? Not from this record. Okay. Um, I've given you another set of sort of library requests, and that is marked as, well, is there a number on that sticker? I didn't write it down. There is. It's D-TR-66. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, we're going to move for admission of D-TR-66. I don't believe there's objection from the people. I'll stipulate. All right. It's uh, admitted by stipulation. Thank you. Now, to save time, I've already handed that to you. Um, so you could review it while the jury was looking at um, the people's exhibit. And is that um, additional library request, request made by Mr. Holmes through your kite system? The yeah, majority of them are. Uh, there are several pages that are missing the header uh, from the copies that I have. Oh, where it sort of prints off, but it, okay. That's strange. I think that was a, a photocopy problem that I did not know in your copy. Um, with regard to these requests, um, I note that in, um, in Mr. Holmes' library requests that the people um, submitted to you, there were a couple requests for sci-fi books. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the records that I've handed you start in February of 2013 and go through... Um, March of 2014? Uh, the first page uh, starts January of 2013. Okay. And goes through March of 20... Uh, goes through, the first page goes from January 3rd, 2013 to May 9th of 2013. Your Honor, I'm going to ask to recess for lunch. There is, seems to be a photocopy issue with this particular exhibit that I didn't notice until now. So I'm going to have to reprint that. All right. Under Sheriff, are you available after lunch? Yes, I am, yeah. All right. Thank you.
All right, members of the jury, let's go ahead and take our lunch break. Before you leave, let me uh, have counsel at the bench, please, so that I can talk about scheduling. Members of the jury, um, I think Ms. Higgs is going to attempt to finish her questioning of the uh, under sheriff, under sheriff Perea, and then uh, we'll go to lunch after that. Okay? Um, is everyone okay? By the way, taking a short lunch today, one hour. Anybody not okay with one hour for lunch? Okay, nobody's raising their hand. Thank you. All right, Ms. Higgs, you may proceed with your cross examination of under sheriff Perea. Thank you. Under Sheriff Perea, even with regard to the pages here that where the header is missing, the Arapahoe County print message report header is missing, it still has um, James Holmes listed as the inmate, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and it still has the same ID number, correct? It does. All right. So you said these start in February of 2013, and what did you say the last date was on the last page? Uh, the first page is from January 3rd, 2013 to May 9th, 2013. The last page, uh, the header is missing. Right, but the date entered. The date entered is uh, March 27th, 2014. Okay. And the date entered on the first page as far as the first request made on that page is February 14th of 2013. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's where I was getting confused in our discussion. Thank you. Okay. Um, you have been able to look through these records briefly there at the bench, is that correct? Or in your seat, is that correct? Briefly, yes. And it, it indicates on the first page that even in uh, February of 2013, there was an additional request for sci-fi books, is that right? Could you ask me that again, ma'am? That first request there on February 14th of 2013 from Mr. Holmes is also for sci-fi books? It is. There's also an additional request for sci-fi books um, on page 10, which would be September 21st of 2013. Yes, ma'am. Okay. In the People's Exhibit... Um, it indicates on the second page that there were requests for, I think, philosophical works, works by Klaus, who was a military war theologian, um, other war stratagem books, things like Plato's Republic, Don Quixote. Do you recall that request from the People's Exhibit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. With regard to the library request from, um, that I have handed you from February 14th of 2013, until um, March 27th of 2014. There were no similar requests like that for books on philosophy. Is that correct? 
I, I don't know specifically. I'd have to go through each one of these. Yeah, if you could just flip through it pretty quickly. And my, my next question is there's also no similar request for books on war stratagem. Not that I noticed, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Is there any redirect? <clears throat> Thank you. If you could take a look at uh, the one I, I had handed you earlier, uh, the People's Exhibit 1088. And what was the date of the request for um, Klaus, and I think he means Klaus Witz, um, Plato's report? Well, he is a military war theologian, Your Honor. I think actually the court can take judicial notice of who Klaus Clausewitz was. I'll sustain the objection. All right, Klaus, um, philosophical works, Plato's Republic, Machiavelli, Don Quixote, etc. What was the date of that request? Well, that was entered uh, July 25th of 2012. Now, we, we have a reference to Plato, and, and counsel had asked you if there were any f similar request. Could you go take a look at the request from October 5th, 2012? In which of their... In, in, in the People's Exhibit. Okay. You know what page that is, sir? Um, let me show you my copy. It's actually the, you know what? It's the fourth be... from last. Okay. Fourth from last, which I think would be the quadrultimate. Okay, the fourth, I, fourth from last that I have is... October 5th? Yes, and what does that say? Uh, standing order, books on philosophy. And what does standing order mean? Do you know? I do not. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, is there any recross? Just to clarify, that was October 5th of 2012, correct? That is correct. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right, there do not appear to be any questions from the jury. Um, may Under Sheriff Correa be released from his subpoena? Mr. Orman? Yes, Your Honor. Any objection? Your Honor, we're asking him to keep him under subpoena. All right. So, under sheriff, you're free to go for now, but you may be called again as a witness, okay? Okay. Thank you very All much, right. sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Members of the jury, it's 20 after 12. Let's go ahead and take our lunch break at this time. It's actually about 12.21 or so. So, let's take an hour, if it's okay with everyone. And let's have you back here in one hour. Keep all my advisements in mind during the break, and I'll see you back here after lunch. Thank you. Remember, folks, today is a day when we have to finish early. We're, we're finishing at 3.30 today. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Everyone may be seated. Is there anything we need to take up at this time on behalf of the people? Your Honor, I have marked for the record what was People's Exhibit 2035 as C-TR-72. Okay. Anything on behalf of the defense? 
Okay, enjoy your lunch. I'll see you back here at uh, 1.23. Please rise.